The conversion of Constantine to Christianity, and with his conversion the cessation of Christian persecution, was a major change in the course of Roman history. It was so monumental that some historians have used the phrase Constantinian shift to describe the alterations to religion, politics, and social structures which emerged during and after Constantine's reign. During that reign, however, Constantine was careful to tread a fine line between the goal of behaving like a new Moses, guiding the state and the populace towards Christianity, and the Roman world as it actually existed at the time. Essentially, while he emphasized the construction of churches, he appears to have had no issue performing traditional duties expected of an emperor. He remained Pontifex Maximus until his death, but at the same time, his tomb was constructed in such a manner as to have his sarcophagus at the center and statues of the Twelve Apostles surrounding it. In the end, both emphasizing his faith and perhaps also a tongue-in-cheek joke as to who Constantine thought he really was. His son Constantius II, however, was not so subtle. This video is going to briefly examine what has sometimes been termed Constantius' revolution, and in doing so I am drawing on the work of the historian Edward Watts in his study of Roman political rhetoric and revolutions, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. Constantine himself emerged out of the civil wars of the Tetrarchy, when the state was split into four administrative divisions which ultimately collapsed into armed conflict, and he mandated that the state was to return to such a system upon his death. No such thing occurred, however, due to a series of civil wars and assassinations that left only two sons, Constantius II and Constans, in a dual power-sharing agreement between 340 and 350. For the growing population of Christians who had lived in the three decades of peace under Constantine, and then the civil wars of his sons, the political and religious rhetoric of Constantine's dynasty eventually became nothing more than mere words, and there was increasing pressure on the sons to build a new system. Ruling the eastern portion of the Roman Empire, Constantius was increasingly influenced by Arianism, a Christian doctrine which stemmed from the bishop Arius who began preaching in the 310s that God the Father and Christ the Son were of two different natures. When Nicene Christians began to take issue with this, Constantius responded by exiling the Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius. Civil war was threatened unless the bishop was allowed to return, which he eventually was allowed to do, but war came anyway in 350 when Magnentius, the commander of the elite regiment of Jervians and Herculeans, rebelled and killed Constans, and proceeded to fight Constantius for three years before eventually being defeated. Eventually, Constantius established his cousin Julian in Gaul, after killing Julian's brother Gallus, who had been sent to watch over the eastern provinces while Magnentius was dealt with, but who proved so problematic that eventually he was recalled and Constantius had him executed. This was the political and religious context in which Constantius II conducted, or attempted to conduct, a series of policies designed to bolster Christianity and increase the religion's influence. A series of laws were passed between 341 and 356 which, in theory, built upon legal precedents which had been established by Constantine, but which went a step farther by actually instituting punishment for engaging in pagan practices such as sacrifices or rituals. Initially, the consequences were vague with the Law of 341 simply stating that the madness of sacrifices was to be abolished, and if any man should dare to perform sacrifices, he shall suffer the infliction of a suitable punishment. By the 350s, however, the laws emphasized the death penalty. Constantius removed the altar of victory from the Senate, and although many non-Christian officials and governors did pay lip service to laws like this, the general Christian and pagan population frequently got into fights and damaged temples, some of which had been given to the church by imperial decree. To a very significant extent, the sun was actively creating the world the father had envisioned, along with the chaos that went along with it. Despite this, however, Constantius never outlawed or made any attempt to formally disband organizations such as the Vestal Virgins, and outside of forbidding sacrifices, he did not formally persecute non-Christians. Constantius did carry on Constantine's policies against the empire's Jewish population, though, limiting commercial enterprises and forbidding the marriage of Jews to Christians or pagans. While the majority of sources from the time are hostile, or at the very least unfavorable to Constantius, probably because of his religious policies, which thus makes it difficult for modern historians to objectively evaluate his reign, not all of those sources are unsympathetic. 
In 357, the philosopher Themistius came before the Senate in Rome and stunned the audience by speaking at length about Constantinople's new prominence. He described how Constantius had decided to make Constantinople fully and completely into a new Rome. The emperor had expanded its infrastructure, granted it privileges that accorded with its status as an imperial capital, and elevated the Constantinopolitan Senate so that it enjoyed parity with that of Rome. The result, Themistius concluded, was that Constantius had become a second Romulus, because through him, Constantinople has genuinely become a new Rome. Constantine had founded Constantinople, but it was Constantius who had cemented the new city as a genuine capital in the east. The initial construction, despite Constantine bringing in pieces from other cities, was actually rather poor and there are accounts of buildings constructed in the 330s having to be torn down a few years later due to poor structural integrity. Constantius, however, engaged in a series of massive building projects designed to turn the city into what it was exactly supposed to be, a genuine second capital, a new Rome in more than just name. By the standards of Constantius's revolution and those who supported him, the new senate in Constantinople no longer needed to be in Rome, because the new city, and the new empire, was here. When push came to shove during the civil wars after Constantine died, it was the military and the resources marshaled in the Constantinopolitan East, not the Roman West, that had saved the Roman Empire. Constantius's revolution was short-lived, however. In 360, his cousin, Julian was proclaimed emperor by troops in the Gallo-Roman town that would eventually become Paris, and another civil war engulfed the Roman Empire. That civil war almost ended with Constantius' victory, but in November of 361 he fell ill and died after fighting some sickness and a fever, and because he had no heir despite his wife being pregnant, and with his cousin's army nearby, Constantius declared Julian to be the new emperor. When his cousin came to power, when his cousin came to power, he would begin to dismantle Constantius' vision of a Christian Roman Empire. But that is a story for another time.